One of the chapters that people talk most about um, is uh, the Blanford Cemetery chapter. And so in the Blanford Cemetery chapter, I, the Blanford Cemetery is one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country where the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are buried. Uh, and I went there for the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration. And I remember I was, I didn't, I didn't write my book proposal and I wasn't like, I'm going to go to the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day event and spend time with neo-Confederates. My wife would have been like, that's not what you're going to do. That's not happening. Um, instead, I went to the P Petersburg, um, the battlefield in, in Petersburg, Virginia, because I thought I was going to write a chapter on Civil War battlefields. And I was there and I was telling the, the uh, park ranger about my project. And he was like, oh, you should go to that Confederate cemetery down the road. And it's almost like in the movies where there's uh, there's like the devil and the angel who appear on your shoulder, except in this instance, it's like regular Clint and writer Clint. And so it's like regular Clint is like, or writer Clint's like, we got to go to the Confederate cemetery. And regular Clint is like, we're absolutely not going to the Confederate cemetery. What are you talking about? But in those instances, I often follow the, the instinct of writer Clint. And so I was like, this is a place I got to go. So I went and I remember um, being at this Confederate cemetery uh, ceremony and i had a conversation with a guy named jeff and jeff had this long salt and pepper goatee this long ponytail this handlebar mustache this round belly a biker vest with confederate paraphernalia all over it and he was telling me a story about how when he was a boy his grandfather used to bring him to the cemetery and he and his grandfather would sit in this beautiful white gazebo at the center of the cemetery and his grandfather would play him play on his banjo and play the this old dixie uh dixie anthem and they would watch the sun set behind the trees and watch the sky turn from blue to uh, purple to orange to black. They would watch the fireflies come out of the forest and hop from one tombstone to the next. They'd watch the deer come out from the trees and graze around the tombstones. And all the while, his grandfather's telling him about how the men who were buried in this field, they're not people who were racist. They're not people who uh, you know, fought for slavery. The Civil War wasn't about slavery. The secession wasn't about slavery. This was about protecting their families, protecting their culture, uh, fighting back against the war of Northern aggression, um, fighting back against the sort of Yankee uh, ideological invasion that was trying to ruin their way of life. And now Jeff would, and Jeff told me that now he brings his own granddaughters to that same gazebo, that same cemetery where his grandfather brought him. And he brings his granddaughters and they walk through the field and uh, sit in the gazebo and he plays on his banjo the same songs that his grandfather played for him. Uh, tells the same stories to his granddaughters that his grandfather uh, told him, watches the same sunset behind the same trees. And so, you know, I could go to Jeff and be like, Jeff, look, man, like I know that your granddad told you secession had nothing to do with slavery. Um, but all you have to do is, do is look at the declarations of Confederate secession, where in 1861, a state like Mississippi says very explicitly in their secession document, our position is thoroughly aligned with the institution of slavery the greatest material interest in the world, right? So they're not vague about why they're seceding. They're very, very clear about it. But the thing is, if Jeff was going to accept that information, he would have to accept that his grandfather was lying to him. And if he has to accept that his grandfather was lying to him, it threatens to disintegrate the foundation of who he understands himself to be, who he understands this man to be, who he understands himself to be in relation to this person who he loves, this person who has shaped his understanding of himself. This person who represents an entire family, an entire community that has shaped who Jeff is. And so suddenly you're not just asking somebody to, to recalibrate uh, their sense of American history. You are creating a, a sort of existential crisis. Right? It's a fundamental crisis of identity for this person. And, and for me, you have to take that part seriously. right? Part of what that trip illuminated for me was that for so many people, history is not about primary source documents or empirical evidence. It's a story that they're told. It's a story that they tell. It's an heirloom that's passed down across generations, something where loyalty takes precedence over truth. And if we don't take seriously the sort of um, human, familial, and, and emotional underbelly that sort of undergirds these really violent, bigoted, uh, uh, ahistorical beliefs, then we're not going to understand what's animating them, right? I think it would be very easy for me to go in and like have turned these guys into like caricatures of bigotry and just be like, look at, you know, done an almost daily show kind of thing and go and like, look how ridiculous they are. But the truth is these are people who 
are around us all over the place. These are people whose kids are on the soccer teams. These are people who are at the grocery store. These are people who go to the same post office, right? So they're not, these are not folks who exist beyond our social worlds and ecosystem. They're very much a part of it. And if, and it's not to say that you accept what they're saying at face value. It's not to say you excuse it, but I do think it's important to understand the sort of human and emotional origins that shape it. And I think just engaging people and, and, and asking questions rather than approaching people with this inherent sort of antagonism um, makes things really illuminating. It doesn't mean you're going to leave and say like, well, now I'm friends with the neo-Confederates or like now I'm, I understand Confederate reenactors. Cause I, I mean, that's something different than, than asking questions that, that help readers, that help audience members, that help us uh, sort of more effectively understand why some people would come to believe something um, that's so true, which is all of which is to say it, they're just more human, right? Rather than, as you said, rather than being caricatures of, um, of you know, Fox News or right-wing extremism, they are human beings who are themselves full of contradictions. Um, and inconsistencies, and, and we have to sit with that.